thank you, Dan. It's a privilege to be here again today to uh, share my family's history and uh, about the and our dealership that we had. I was very blessed to be able to grow up in a fam our family-owned dealership as a, growing up as a kid. I had a lot of memories and uh, exciting things that happened during that time, and uh, we'll uh, get right into it here. So, in Nebraska, red runs deep, and uh, we have two big reds. First one's Big Red Football. We love our Huskers. The second one is Big Red IH tractors and combines. So, uh, like I said, red runs deep in Nebraska, and uh, we uh, had a. It was uh, I always thought that gave International Harvester an advantage in Nebraska, having Big Red tractors go along with the Big Red Football, and uh, uh, it was a fun time growing up. Anyway, our story starts down in the southeast part of the state of Nebraska little town or county named Jefferson County and up in the northwest corner of the county there was a little town named Dakin and Dakin was founded back in 1887 it was named after a man named John Dakin and he worked for the railroad he was a conductor and his claim to fame was he was the conductor in charge of President Lincoln's funeral train when it was traveling uh, when it left Washington DC uh, to Cleveland Ohio so he was a conductor on that train uh, he happened to be in the you know, 1860s, 70s, uh, the West was opening up and he happened to be out in our area in 1869 and he purchased some land uh, in the area. And, uh, but nothing happened there for a while until the railroad started coming. And a lot, like a lot of towns uh, in Nebraska, Kansas, uh, they were founded by the railroads. And uh, so our town was also founded by a railroad, Omaha and Kansas City Railroad. And, uh, Whereas many of the early lines were going east to west, or west to east to west, this line was built to go from uh, south to north, and uh, so that was a little unique. The idea was trying to connect to all these east-west lines going uh, uh, by running this line north and south. They could connect with interchange with all of the east -west, other east-west lines, you know, in the northern part of the state, and uh, so that was how the, the town was platted then by the railroad. Uh, on July 4th, 1887, the first building was constructed, and by the eight, August of 87, the uh, railroad had already had was laying track through town, and uh, there was a lot of productive farmland in the area, and uh, that was drawing families to come to the area and settle there, and businesses were also being established in to help serve those families in that area. So, um, for our story of our of our dealership. It was founded by my great-grandfather, Harry uh, Schmidt, who married Emma, and uh, we also had a nickname of Dick. And to their union was blessed three sons and two daughters. So, uh, the sons were Ralph, uh, Sid, and Winifred, and uh, daughters were Hazel and Beulah. And they, we had a family farm. We still have the family farm today. It was a mile west, a mile south of town. We had a quarter section of land. As the boys were growing up and getting, getting, completing their education, back in those days you only went through the eighth grade, but you had a really good education doing it. And uh, so as they were getting, going to be completing their school so soon, my great grandfather decided he needed something for these boys to do because we didn't have enough farmland for all of them to farm. And he thought uh, maybe you know going into starting a business in the farm equipment area would be uh, a good thing for uh, the boys to help uh, have them, to, for them to have something to do and keep them out of trouble. So he decided then to write letters to the different companies and asking, inquiring about the possibility of a dealership. And so he sent off a number of letters and he received two responses back. One was from the International Harvester Company and the other one was from J.I. Case. So when the business was organized, we were at Case IH dealer before there ever was a Case IH. So because we, we took on both lines. Uh, the name of the company when it, the business when we started, it was Harry Schmidt and Sons. And it was old, we started out in a, a, a former car dealership building that was already existing on Main Street. And uh, so we, we opened there and then immediately began constructing a second building to, uh, to use as well. And uh, for this, this new building they were building, uh, you know, the money was kind of tight. And so they, they decided that they could save some money by making their own blocks. They made, made concrete blocks. They had forms they got and they, every morning they would mix up a batch of concrete, pour those into the blocks, and uh, the ones they did the day before, after they'd cured enough, they'd, they'd take them into town, work on the building in their spare time, next day, repeat, basically, you know, bust out the 
the blocks you made the day before, make a new batch of concrete, pour some more blocks, take the new ones in it, the ones that were finished, ready in the town and, and work on the building. So uh, they had a good, good process there they used to uh, construct a, the new building. And my grandpa, as he, he finished high or eighth grade education, uh, he then uh, went to electrical school and got some training in automotive and, and electrical to know how to work on things. So this is our the set the building then the, the new building they completed there in 1915. And it was complete with the showroom area and the parts and office and the, and the shop area. But the shop area is on the north end of the building. And you'll there's a picture there you can see it. Um, uh, it shows what the inside of it looked in the shop area. It, look, it looks kind of crude and rude and crude, but uh, uh, I did some research and uh, the company had published a, a book in the, the late 20s which showed some of the best in class businesses and shops at that time and, and the, the look is very similar. So we were, we were you know, best in class, state of the art at that time uh, for our shop area. <laughs> so uh, as we started in, in, in late 1914, 1915, we were selling uh, you know, McCormick gearing equipment, the Titan, the mobile tractors, binders, uh, mowers, tillage implements, uh, thrashing machines, uh, stationary engines were also very popular back then, and, and also the primrose cream separators. And on the case side, we sold mainly thrashing machines and steam engines there. Uh, best I can tell are we, uh, the contract with case, we gave that, some, gave that up sometimes in, in the 40s. So, so we had a, about a 20 year run there with, with Case, and then we just continued on with so strictly international at that time. Some of the things that were going on in the company at this time, um, the uh, company was entering its teen years as, uh, since the merger in 1902. Uh, one you know, significant event that happened was World War I. Uh, started in 1917. And uh, so I always say that was a starting shot heard around the world. It was also a starting shot of farm, uh, farm mechanization. The, the men were getting drafted and going off to war, and you know, farming at that time was still very labor intensive. And uh, uh, so when the men weren't no longer there, they were you know, shipping off to war, uh, there was a need for equipment and mechanism, uh, you know, mecha being able to mechanize to do more uh, with less manpower. Uh, so that was a, a big boost for the implement, uh, farm equipment manufacturers. Uh, of course, International Harvester was busy developing new products at that time as well. So you know, we're in the teen years. The merger of the, the the five companies that formed International Harvester, it was it was had its ups and downs. It was kind of tough. Uh, there were some dealers, you know, they were McCormick dealers. They wanted nothing to do with the Deering. You know, they didn't want any product there. It was Deering related, and they had Deering dealers. They didn't want anything to do with McCormick. So it took a while to work through all those. But by you know, 1915, 17, the, the company was integrating the product lines and, and the production lines and. Uh, so there was becoming the true international harvester uh, products then. Although they still kept McCormick during the name you know, along to keep some of these dealers happy. Um, company also, they were expanding. They bought a, a plant in the Rock Island area named the Tri-Cities plant, which would soon become a, a major part of the company. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. They are also rapidly developing their, their dealer distribution work and also their own internal distribution work network. So they were in a grow, growth mode. Uh, the farmland was being settled to the west. They were adding dealerships wherever they could find you know, interested parties. Uh, and then you know, they could have a dealership in a blacksmith shop, hardware store, even grain elevators. Some of them actually took on dealerships, uh, garages. And if they couldn't find somebody to, to take on a dealership, the, but they thought it was really going to be a promising area, the company would actually build a company store there, a Greenfield site as I like to call it. That, uh, they just put up a building and, and start a dealership there and hire somebody to run it. Uh, and like in 1925 in our county alone there was three International Harvester dealerships. You had one down in Steel City, one in Plymouth, Nebraska, and then our family dealership in Bacon. On the motor truck side, uh, the motor truck you know, was wasn't there when the company was formed. It happened kind of. It's kind of interesting story how, how IH got into the motor trucks. Um, their chief engineer at that time, you know, the, the horse was carried was kind of a novelty, and people were you know designing their own. And he, he thought I can design and build a better uh, car than what a lot of other people were doing. And so he and he worked at his half hours. He designed and built his own car, and he'd drive it to start driving it to work every day. Well. Cyrus Jr., Cyrus McCormick Jr., 
saw that, and one day the chief engineer gave him a ride in that car, and, and uh, so they got they toured around town there in Chicago and uh, got off and got back to the plant. And Cyrus said, she said, you know, I think why don't you start designing a vehicle that we could sell? And he had one stipulation: it had to be able to haul something. It had to have you know it had to have a bed on it or something to uh, haul. And that was part of this marketing genius of Cyrus McCormick and Cyrus Jr. They knew how to market things, and he saw the potential because he knew a lot of farmers had wagons they used to, to haul things to town, uh, their crops and whatnot, and bring supplies back to the farm. And he thought, no, with these horses, carriages are coming. You know, we should try to do that and to make it so they could use a, a, a motorized version of the wagon to haul their, you know, instead of using the horse, use the motorized vehicle. And uh, so that was part of the marketing genius. You know, Cyrus saw that potential. And also, he, had, he thought there would be opportunities to sell in the big cities as well for, for delivery vehicles. So, so anyway, uh, they took a few years, but the chief engineer got the auto buggy and the wagon in production, and they proved successful. And so the company uh, continued developing new products. In 1915, they introduced the F model. In 1917, the K and G models were introduced, and they were some of the first medium and heavy duty trucks. Also, World War One drove a huge demand for mechanized vehicles, and so trucks were a big part of that. And, uh, they, and then the government after the war realized, you know, we really need to improve our roads network. At that time, a lot of roads there were not maintained. Uh, they were just ruts and trails. And, and so they started developing a road network, which also gave uh, Harvester, you know, other opportunities for the long haul market, the long haul trucks. So uh, yeah, it's a good timing that Harvester, you know, Cyrus McCormick Jr. saw that potential and he developed it. And then trucks rapidly became a big part of the company. Here you see uh, the slide, if you can see it, it shows the distribution network within the company. So the, the company would establish branch offices in bigger cities, and uh, they could be truck or, or ag or both. And so as the, the West was being settled, they were you know, expanding their uh, distribution network with the new branch offices. And uh, by, uh, you know, between 1915 and 25, they had, 1925, they had over 100 general line branch offices, mostly the ag had 153 motor truck offices. So you see how rapidly we had more branch offices on the truck side than they did on the ag side, how rapidly the trucks became a big part of the International Harvester Company. In Nebraska, we had two branch offices then in this time frame. One was in Omaha, Nebraska. It was downtown there, uh, not too far away from the Union Station. And then in Lincoln, there was also a branch office. The Omaha office served uh, most of the dealers in the northern part of the state and then the Lincoln office served the southern part of the state, as well as some uh, dealers along the northern Kansas border with Nebraska. So uh, the branch offices, they help support the dealers and farmers. Uh, they, they are usually warehouses for equipment. They, the company would, would ship equipment from the factories to the, the branch offices, the warehouses, and then the dealers could come to the branch offices and pick up their equipment that they'd ordered. And so they do drop shipments there. And, and they'd usually maintain some inventory at the branch offices as well, in case the dealer sold something and didn't have, didn't have it in stock, he could go to call the branch office and say, hey, do you got a disc or I sold this, I need this. And a lot of times the branch offices would have that implement there, then they could go pick it up again. So um, some of the branch offices also had retail operations. If there wasn't a, already an existing dealer nearby, so they would sell directly to the public and the farmers. And uh, then they also would provide service support for those uh, to their customers, as well as they'd also provide service support to the dealers. Another significant event that happened in the company at this time in 1923-24 was the introduction of the Farmall Regular. And that really was, you know, started the Farmall Revolution. And they had one tractor that had multiple uses. The tractors before that were primarily heavy tillage type. Uh, they didn't have a lot of implements or anything. The Farmall was a regular, it was a you know, lightweight tractor. They had the company design, you know, cultivators, planters, it had multiple per, multiple uses. And so that was, uh, when that was launched, it, sales just took off, really uh, surpassed the company's expectation. And uh, the production of the farm wall started in Rock Island, Illinois, and pretty soon that plant was renamed called the Farmall Works. So, uh, so the Tri-Cities plant became the Farmall Works. And it was IH's answer to the Fordson. And the, they produced them by the train loads. Uh, the, uh, Nebraska Lincoln office there, they had a special ordering period where the dealers could place their orders and then they had this, this train load of the farm all regulars come in there. And there's a picture we had hung, hanging in our dealership for many years. 
uh, it shows us every 60 or I can I, I tried to count all the cars. There's over 60 cars in that train. It's, it was a really, really long train, and they had it, every car had at least six farm oil regulars on it. And uh, so here is a picture of our first train a train load of farm oil regulars there in 1924 that came into our dealership there in front of the building. So that was a big event when those came in, and uh, the, uh, they really sold really well. And uh, so another significant event in our family occurred in 1923. My father was born, and uh, so here's a couple pictures of him up by the, up, up there at the shop, growing up in the in the dealership, and then also my uh, uncle Sid, great uncle Sid, there he was running a 1020 there or a 1530 dragging the roads there, and uh, another implement that uh, IH introduced in 1925 was the the first pull type combines. So IH was continuing to evolve the Reaper and the thrashing machine by combining them together, making the combine. Uh, those early one combines, of course, were self, or not self propelled they were pull type. Uh, so that, but that was another, you know, huge leap in technology for the farmers that, uh, that it could uh, cut the crop, thrash it, and all in one operation. And uh, so that was another significant event. And there's a, one of the combines that we sold there, one of our customers, Bill Klein and Charlie, um, I, I remember Charlie Ke uh, Klein as a kid growing up, living, he's living in town then, and uh, so they bought one of the first combines that we sold. And uh, on the motor truck side in 1925, we, we also took on the motor truck line. We didn't take that on initially. It turns out that the, the dealer, or the, the fellow that was running the car dealership where we started, he, he, uh, he was a manager for them, so, but he, so when, he, uh, when the company, you know, we took over the, the building where we started, that was in the former car dealership building. He went down the street and opened up a, a car dealership of his own, but he also had international trucks. So that's why we didn't have the truck line for the first 10 years. Uh, they, uh, uh, we then, but when he finally gave it up, then we took it over in, in 1925. So we sold mainly primary light, light and medium duty trucks. So the 20s was a very prosperous time period uh, for our nation and also for our, our, my little hometown of Dakin. Uh, farm me mechanization was taking hold, so that was, you know, made good business for the, the de uh, implement dealerships. Our community and uh, businesses were growing. And we also got a little competition next door. Uh, uh, John Deere dealership opened up in 1922, and so we had a, had a competitor right next door to our dealership. I asked my grandpa one time, you know, he said, did that bother you when the Rosner family opened up uh, this dealership? right next door and he said no he said i welcomed it he says i, I he was glad that he had some competition there because he said somebody might come to town farmer might come to town you know thinking he's going to buy a john deere dealer or a john deere tractor but you know he might come over and see what we had to offer as well and i'd have a chance then to try to sell him an inter international tractor so so he, he he was glad to have the competition and uh and he uh, uh didn't didn't mind at all that hey, we had a john deere dealer right next door also, my dad, as he, as he got old enough, a uh, little story my Uncle Harvey told me uh, about my dad when he was uh, real young. Um, my, uh, uh, my mom's dad, my, and Uncle Harvey's dad, he bought a first, his first from far, all regular. And so my grandpa delivered that. My dad rode along with, there, and uh, when they got the tractor out there, they drove it out there on this just steel, steel rims. They were all, all the tractors back then were all steel wheels, of course. And so when it got out to the farm, they had to put the lugs on. And so my grandpa then started, once they got out to the, to the farm there, it was eight miles uh, east of town. And my grandpa started putting the lugs on. And my dad would hold the ranch there so my grandpa could tighten, tighten the bolts on the, uh, those lug nuts. And uh, the, uh, my Uncle Harvey, he was a little older than my dad. He, he was kind of jealous because my dad was helping, you know, with uh, getting that tractor set up. And he was a little jealous of my dad being so young and being helping to get that tractor, get those steel lugs installed in the tractor. As we close out the 1920s, uh, another life event happened in our family where my great-grandfather, Harry Schmidt, unexpectedly passed away of a heart attack. So that uh, caused some changes within the dealership then. Um, then the, but my grandpa and uh, Sid, his brother, decided to continue on with the business. So they changed the name then to Schmidt Brothers and had to you know, sign a new contract with the company. Uh, Uncle Sid worked the, the sales aspect of the company. He liked to talk and visit with people, so he, he did the sales. And then my grandpa uh, took over running the parts and service air department. And, uh, and then the younger brother, Winifer, Winnie, uh, Uncle Winnie, uh, 
he took over the family farm at that time. So, uh, and now you know, a lot of dealerships had had to have a farm. Sometimes you traded for horses or something uh, for him to sell a tractor, so you had to have a place for the horse to go. <laughs> and so, uh, so we, you know, the family farm helped there with the, the implement dealership as well. And then, of course, another event that happened in our nation at the end of 1929 was the great stock market crash, and that ushered our nation into the Depression era. And so as we start the 30s, the key thing was survival, trying to survive. And uh, uh, money was tight, and so the farmers didn't have money to buy new equipment, so they had to you know, use what they had, and they had to maintain it. And so parts and service became a very important aspect of the business. And, um, and then also uh, we started doing custom work as well, that the farmers didn't have money to buy new equipment, but we'd, uh, we'd order a corn sheller or, or a combine and we'd do, we'd do custom work for the farmers to help them as well. And, and, and we could you know, help reduce, you know, get some of the, recoup some of the costs of the, the implement and then be able to sell it at a cheaper price later. And, uh, and also that in trucking, we were, you know, frequently had, as a dealer, you had to make trips up to Lincoln or Omaha to get, get equipment. So if a farmer had some cattle or something he needed to get to market, we, we would haul the cattle up on the way up to uh, get it to the stockyards and drop it off and then go pick up the implements and bring them back, back home. So you had to do those you know, things to, to survive. And also we got into cars a little bit there at various times. We had the Dodge uh, line for a while in Buick and, and Studebaker. So uh, we, we did that as well to try to make ends meet. On the company side, of course, the company was also in a survival mode, and uh, with, uh, they had significant cutbacks there in the early 30s because of the, the depression. But one thing that the harvester had that a lot of other companies did not have was the truck line. The truck line actually helped keep them in the black, and uh, so they they were uh, you know still able to be profitable and continuing to do some product development and expansion. In Nebraska, they added a new branch office. You can believe it, 1931, right at the beginning of the near the. You know, year in that depression era um, they had a branch office in Grand Island to help support the growing dealer network there along the Platte River Valley and in western Nebraska also 1931 marked the 100th anniversary of the Reaper so the Cyrus McCormick invented and uh, perfected and, and started producing so that was another significant event and uh, like I said they, the company was able to, since they were still generating revenue and staying profitable they were able to you know, continue to invest in the future uh, they introduced the F-series truck tractors there then in 1932 and the letter series by the end of, of their 1939 uh, introduced another new series of D-series trucks in 37 and they also introduced the, the first self-propelled harvester so um, there are some pictures of some of our customers and, and their farm at work, the farm regular on a thrashing machine there, a case, or a case thrashing machine. Um, Hauser family, they had, uh, they were a big family, so they had, they had their own thrashing crew, with all, all the brothers there worked together. And uh, so uh, as the economy, as the 30s progressed, the latter half of the 30s, the economy did start to improve. Sales uh, improved, especially in the truck side. It, they had saw the recovery was much quicker than on the ag. And then finally, the, the letter series H uh, and M were introduced in 1939. And so here's a, the 1939 Farmer F20. That was the last uh, F20 that we sold. There it was sold to uh, William Endorf, and his family still has that tractor to this day. Yet, so it's uh, been in the family there a lot of years already. So <clears throat> my dad graduated high school then in the, the 30s, and uh, uh, here you have a picture of all the, the three brothers and my dad. Um, there after, and then of course, another uh, significant event that happened in 1941 was the uh, December 7th, uh, World War II. Uh, the U.S. got drawn into World War II with the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And, and uh, my dad, uh, he, uh, he didn't get drafted right away. He actually went down to Wichita, worked for a year down there before he got drafted. And in 1942, he went into the service. So there, my dad, after he was on leave there, and we got a picture of all the brothers and uh, my dad. Uh, when the war started, everything changed overnight. Sales, you know, sales were strong. Um, there was a big demand for equipment, again, because men were going off to war. So, you know, we had to mechanize even more. And uh, so it was uh, strong sales. Uh, but then came the rationing. So, you know, a lot of the war effort was taking a lot of supplies, food. So uh, things were rationing, so it was tough to get things. Uh, I remember my mom, when she got her first car, she needed a new tire for her first car, I think the Model T. And she tried to find a new tire. And somebody said, well, maybe go up to Schmitz and Dakin. They might have a tire. So she went up there. And sure enough, my grandpa had a tire and got her back on the road. 
And uh, the other thing that IH did at the time, at that time as well, is they had these big scrap drives, scrap drives to you know get scrap metal so they could use for war production. And uh, they worked through the dealer network to have these scrap drives. And we, our dealer, we shipped, we participated in that as well. And farmers had old equipment that they weren't using anymore. They'd bring them in and contribute to the scrap drives, and, and then the company would help get that scrap to the put the, to the mills where they could be melted and reused. And uh, Harvester had a very important role in World War II. Um, their expertise in large-scale manufacturing was critical to the war effort, so that a number of the factories were converted to for weapons production, especially the trucks, track vehicles that were produced you know, by the thousands there during the war effort. Uh, Farmall plant, I've seen pictures, you know, where they have a tractor coming down the line, right behind it there would be a cannon coming down the line. So, you know, they were multi-purpose uh, production there on the production lines uh, to support the war effort. You know, tractors were an important part of the war effort as well, because they, they knew the, the government knew that, you know, the farmers needed the tractors to help produce food, to feed the troops and feed the nation. And so the tractors and ag equipment did have priority as well. So they have you know these various co-production situations. And uh, uh, one thing though, during the World War II, all the resources were going to supporting the war effort, and the company slowed down some of their development effort, and which is unfortunate because it kind of I think hurt hurt them down the road a little bit. The 123 self-propelled combine was introduced in 1942, and that was a very critical thing for the war effort uh, in food production and. Uh, over the years that they built that, they built over 10,500 units of the, of the 123. So there again, you know, you can, you've got a self-propelled combine. You didn't have, the have to have a guy on a tractor pulling the, driving the tractor and another guy on the combine running the combine. So uh, it was the one one operator could handle, do all that. So so that was a very important, mild, uh, significant improvement in the way of doing things and improving efficiency on the farm. World War II then came to an end in 1946. My dad returned home, returned home in 47. Um, my dad didn't join the business right away. Uh, he, he farmed, rented out some land, farmed for a couple years there. But my grandpa and Sid were busy, you know, with plans to construct a new prototype building. It was an initiative that Harvester was trying to improve their branding image and and uh, standardize you know, the dealership operations. So it was a uh, some initiatives that the company had, so they were encouraging dealers to build a new building. And so my grandpa was, uh, you know, very on board with that at that time. And uh, so they were the company provided a kit that they could use to help plan out the floor plan of the dealership. And, and uh, they constructed it. They started the construction in 1948 on the building. Um, Sid, though, had to retire from the business due to health issues. He had, his health was failing, and uh, so then. My grandpa had to buy his share of the business out, and uh, so then the name changed again to just to Ralph Schmidt Implement. And uh, then in 1950, my dad uh, joined as a business partner, and the name then was also it changed again uh, to Schmidt Implements, and that was the, the name we used then until the end, uh, when we closed down. So, so here's some pictures of our, our prototype building that was completed there in 1950. Uh, can't see it very well, but if you, the picture you're looking in through the windows, you can see, you know, there's like a farm I am there on the, in the showroom area. Uh, over on the, the west side of the building was the, the uh, where we had the refrigeration line. Uh, there in a big display area with all the refrigeration products, the deep freeze and refrigerators. And uh, so uh, it was, uh, you know, very modern uh, state-of-the-art design there based on the company's plans. Now, you'll notice also one thing, we did not have a pylon on the building. That was uh, kind of, a, you know, a signature uh, I iconic. <laughs> Uh, symbol of the prototype buildings and I asked my dad one time why well, I said why didn't we have a pylon on our dealership building and he said well he said we talked to several dealers that you know had built buildings before we did and all of them had the same complaint about the pylon where that where it interfaced with the roof and the walls it always would leak it, it could it always have trouble when it rained it would leak and so they decided to avoid that problem by not putting the pylon in on our dealership we just put a the I, lighted IH neon sign on top there and uh, did with that and the company was okay with that. There's another view of the, the west side of the building, southwest side, and this is on the north side of the building in the service high bay area. And uh, so this is a picture of my grandfather on the, when they had their grand opening in 1950. The building was all concrete blo block construction, but this time we bought the concrete blocks. We didn't make them ourselves. So <laughs> it, had, it was complete with a, a nice uh, parts department showroom area. Um, 
we're, we're in the process of designing and uh, you know finalizing plans and building the building. My grandpa found out that the branch office in Lincoln was going to remodel, have a remodel their parts department area. So he uh, he asked around a little bit and he said, uh, you know, any chance I could buy the, the existing parts bins and, and uh, counters and stuff that they had up there in the building, the branch office that, that before they remodeled it. And they said, sure, we'd sell that to you. So we were able to save quite a bit there uh, by uh, buying the furnishings out of the branch office so they could remodel and put in the new, the new furnishings. And uh, our furnishings, though, were, do the, you know, deluxe. Uh, they, you know, the end caps on the parts bins there, there's are nice rounded corners. Uh, you know, they weren't just square edges or anything. They were nice and rounded, nice, and you put product out there, uh, accessories on display. Uh, the parts counters were all real nice. And uh, so we, it was really nice. We had the tri-level uh, display tables that you could roll around and display your uh, different things on them uh, for sale. The service bay, high bay area uh, was uh, uh, we had used a large, a lot of large glass block windows in the construction of those to allow in natural lighting. Electricity was kind of new back in those days, and it was kind of expensive. So we tried to take advantage of the natural light by putting these large block, block windows in, glass block windows in. Uh, we had a wash paint room area, service bays, tool room. So it was all you know right up to company standards. There's this picture here kind of shows you the, uh, the layout of the building if you can see it. Uh, it's north of the front part of the building was this showroom and parts counter area, uh, and then uh, the back was all uh, the service bays and washroom, paint room, and uh, had a welder there and oil storage and all that. So, so as we entered began the 1950s, uh, uh, Grandpa was in charge, you know, basically in charge of management oversight of the, the dealership. Uh, he did, then started doing more sales and service calls. He still got service calls. He was really good at repairing balers. Uh, he knew how to repair those those knotters and everything. And so, if a farmer was having trouble, you know, Grandpa would go out and work on it. I remember going out in the 70s, going out a lot, a lot of times within those hot summer days, and we're out there in the dusty hay field trying to bale, and we were having to work on those balers and get the knife sharpened and fix whatever needs needed to be fixed to help the farmers get back back to work. Um, my dad took over the run in the shop, and he was also in charge of the parts department. Uh, and he did set up an inventory of new equipment. And um, he also, had, was every week, we had to do a weekly stock order. Well, that was always due on Monday, so we had always we kept track of what we sold, and so we could restock. My dad always had a philosophy of very, for parts. Of if a farmer had a part that broke, he'd order two of them. One to get the farmer back in operation, and one to stock. And he figured, well, if it broke for that farmer, it might break for one of our other customers. We wanted to have that part available so that we could get get the farmer back in, in operation as quickly as possible. So over the years, we accumulated a, quite a bit of inventory of parts. Also, a life event that happened in 1950 was my dad got married. So my, he married my mom, Bernice. And then my mom kind of got involved with the business. She had an accounting business background, and she was a school teacher as well. And uh, she kind of specialized in accounting. So. Uh, the company during the 50s was encouraging dealers to standardize their operations and business practices and, and so uh, my mom had to set up a new accounting system that the company was recommending that we use and so she had to go through the old ledger that my grandpa and, and Sid had maintained over the years and trying to reconcile all the, the records and everything and put anything into the, and put it you know, into the new system. And anyway, as she was doing that, she discovered that you know, there were some farmers that owed us some money and also that the, the local county uh, roads department had been coming up and buying oil from my grandpa for many years. And, but my grandpa never sent out statements to collect. He just trusted the customers. He knew when they had the money, they would come and settle up. And, and so anyway, my mom saw that the county owed us quite a bit of money, so she wrote up a statement, sent it off to the county uh, courthouse there in February. And, a couple days later, one of the county commissioners come up to visit. He wasn't very happy, <laughs> and uh, so it turned out, you know, the county, you know, they uh, governments, all governments, mostly, you know, they run on a fiscal year basis, and they budget what they think they need for uh, expenses for the year. And, and so when this bill came in for, you know, so five, six years worth of oil that the roads department had been getting, it blew their budget. So. Uh, he was not happy about that, and Mom well, kind of explained the situation. He said, well, let's make sure that never happens again. So uh, she also would pay the bills and, and do payroll for our employees. So uh, Mom became a very important part of it. My mom is still living. She's 90, she'll be 97 here, August 13th, and uh, she's still with us, and uh, we enjoy having her. Um, 
I'm grateful that she's still with me, so, uh, and with my wife, so. Um, in 1950, Chicago started this, the Central Training School for Dealers, as I mentioned earlier. So my grandpa went to Chicago for a 10-day period to get trained on uh, the standard, you know, dealership operations, best practices, and uh, went through that school. So there was a picture of the men that, uh, dealers that went through it back in 1950, then the grandpa was there, on the, the right, and uh, then in 1951, my dad went through that same school. So, and this school was in the, the 180 South Michigan Avenue building where the company was at at that time. And they say that uh, this room where this picture was taken now is an auditorium there or a classroom. Or, and uh, that the doors on the front of that auditorium, the uh, handles are shaped like the IH logo. And they say they're, they're still there yet. Yeah, like, next time I go to Chicago, I'm gonna try to look that up and see if that's true. So, but I had a fellow in Alabama tell me that there uh, two years ago. That, uh, that was the 180 South Michigan Avenue address. So there my dad went, uh, he was in the class there on the left. Another thing that IH got into in 1950 was the refrigeration uh, line. Uh, this is a Fowler McCormick initiative. He was CEO at that time. And he had this uh, goal that he wanted uh, IH to be a household word in every house you know, across the nation. So he thought a good way to do that would be to you know, build refrigerators for people that they'd hire, you know, have the I true symbol there in every household. Well, it, it was a good idea, but it didn't didn't work out so well. Uh, when they got it, you know, they built the Evansville plant uh, and got into refrigeration. In the rural areas, the things, the refrigerators, uh, deep freezes sold very well because the local people there, there's electric, you know, REA was still going on. Areas were getting electrified. One of the first things the farmers would buy was to be a deep freeze so they could have, you know, freeze store meat at home um, there. So the, the deep freeze is sold very well, refrigerators sold very well. And in the big cities, there was too much competition. You had, you know, Sears with their, their Kenmore line, uh, Frigidaire, Whirlpool. So there was a lot of competition. So in the big cities, it, there wasn't, uh, I don't know, maybe they weren't able to compete enough on price, but uh, they didn't sell so well. So after about six years of being in the refrigeration business, IH finally decided to get out of that and see uh, Tyler McCartney was no longer CEO. Uh, they got out of that. But over the course of this six, six years time frame that we sold refrigeration, we actually was a pretty good business. We sold 72 freezers in our area. You know, just, we're just a small town, you know, 150, 200 people. Uh, but you know, when the customer, our farmers in the area, uh, we sold 40 refrigerators and three air conditioners in that time frame. So, and one of the last refrigerators we sold, my mom and dad bought, and that was 1955, 56. That refrigerator is still running today. I still have it at my mom's. And uh, so that says something about the quality of the IH products at that time. They were very, very good. And, and we have a deep freeze down in the basement that's still running, so we still use. So during the 50s, then, I call it the fabulous 50s, there was the introduction of three new tractor series. Um, in the early 1950s, the you know, H&M were kind of getting long in its teeth. Of course, you had an interruption with World War II there a little bit, but um, they came out with a Super H, Super M, and, uh, and then the MTA. Uh, but then finally, the 52, I think, the, the 400, 300 and 400s series came out. So it had a lot of nice improvements, but basically it was an H&M, but they were, they were greatly improved. And uh, with the live PTO, live hydraulics, and things like that, so that was a you know, good improvement. And a few years later, they came out with the 450, 350, 450, the 50 series. And then by 1958, they introduced the, uh, the 60 series tractors, the 460 and the 560. So, and everybody thought, boy, these, when they came out with the 60 series tractors, they had a big dealer uh, introduction in Chicago. They had all the dealers come in Chicago. I assume my grandpa went to that because he, he tried to be supportive of all the, you know, when the company asked the dealers to do something, he, he tried to help participate in that. It was called the New World of Power. And, you know, six cylinders, engines, um, and everything. And they were really sharp looking tractors, and we thought this was going to be really good. But unfortunately, when the 460, 560s got out in the fields, the farmers, they started having problems with them, especially the transmissions. And so there was a, a major recall effort, retrofit, to, and they had to make production changes on the line to, to correct some of the deficiencies there they found in the, the transmission. And uh, so the company, you know, followed the McCormick promise. They stood behind their product. The dealers helped you know, get those tractors all repaired and back in service. But it still, it, it harmed the image of the company. It, uh, and, it, and the company, you know, started 
a lot of people left, switched to different color tractors, they never came back. So that, that was kind of a little black eye on the company image there a little bit before 60 and 560. As we enter the 60s, then, uh, I call it the swinging 60s, we were, uh, another life event happened first. I'll, I was born 1962, so I was the fourth generation. So there's a picture of my grandpa and grandma, and grandma grandma's holding me and my mom and dad. Uh, we were in full line, ag line dealer. Uh, we were still in the motor trucks selling pickups and medi medium duty trucks. We also got into irrigation a little bit. That, uh, it was developing in our area. We had a, our area had a uh, underground water uh, there through the Ola aquifer. And uh, so we started selling IH uh, industrial power units. Uh, you gotta put an irrigation well, you gotta have a, a motor to run it. So we, we would sell uh, irrigation motors. And also we started selling short lines, uh, irrigation pipe and supplies as well. There. And uh, also our IH came out with the new windmowers and uh, uh, my grandpa had ordered one and had it for a while, we weren't selling it. So he decided to put it in the service and, and we started doing custom hay swapping for, for uh, our farmers in the area that were growing uh, alfalfa. On the company side, there was uh, some things that were going on. Uh, they started consolidating their branch offices and uh, trying to cut costs there a little bit. So the Lincoln branch office that we had used many years was closed. And also the Grand Island office that was opened back there in 31 was closed and everything was consolidated to Omaha. They built, had a new building there out on, uh, I think it was K Street or L Street, L Street I think, uh, where the, they had the, became the district office there and that covered the entire uh, state of Nebraska. So all the dealers there. Nebraska would go to Omaha then for, for uh, equipment. And I think also they did a little bit in Iowa, some of the Iowa dealers, and maybe even up in the South Dakota part of Sioux Falls area. I'm not sure, but I know Omaha, Nebraska was covered largely by the Omaha district office. And, uh, and also the company, it was a very productive time for the company. They introduced a number of uh, iconic products, uh, you know, starting with the Scout and the Cub Cadet. So that, that helped, that was, you know, Fowler McCormick score having IH be a household name was really fulfilled like with the Scout and Cub Cadets because there they actually started selling those more in the city areas and you know house general you know regular people uh, working people would buy buy a Scout to, to have or have a Cub Cadet to take care of their yard and so that kind of fulfilled Fowler McCormick's vision it was just a decade later that uh, that happened and uh, uh, the other thing, uh, the 806, 706 series tractors were introduced there about 1964. And uh, by the end of the decade, we were in, uh, had the 56 series and 26 series tractors, so the 1026 and uh, 1256, 1456. And those were some really good tractors. Uh, those tractors, the uh, 806 um, was a really top line model. And then a year a later or two, they introduced the 1206. That was the first tractor to have a turbo. Uh, and then that, Plus, with the white fenders and the white trim on the radiator housing, it was give it a very distinctive look. And I know the very, maybe those very tractors are still very desirable and flexible today. So, there's a, a video. Hopefully, you can see a little bit. There's uh, my grandfather carrying me there down Main Street, going over into the Methodist Hall. There must have been election day. We were going get, to get, get a meal there. And also, I got my first scout. So, there's me, my little pedal, pedal scout. See, I got my wagon there in the back. I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna try to hook that wagon onto the back, but unfortunately, I didn't have the optional hitch. To, <laughs> so, so I couldn't hook up my wagon. So finally, I gave up. And I'm going down the street to check out the hardware store, and they sold lawnmowers as well to compete with our Cub Cadets. So I had to go check out the competition. So, as we closed out the 1960s. Uh, my grandfather was honored for being a 55-year dealer, uh, and this was done in the Omaha district. They did it in conjunction with the 815 and 915 combine introduction. It was up in Columbus, Nebraska, February 69. They recognized him there for being a dealer for 55 years, and uh, the uh, so you see there a picture. They got the 915 in the background. They had, they had replicas of the Reaper there for that as well as uh, you know. The 915 and 15 series combines, they were, uh, you know, had some new advancements there. And uh, I think that combine in the picture there, the 915, we actually sold that combine. We sold serial number 502, so that was a very early production model combine. We sold it to my Uncle Glenn on my mom's side, who's my mom's brother. He bought that combine and uh, he ran it for about six years. 
Uh, unfortunately, the 815, 915 combines, you know, they were, uh, the 915 was actually a new class of combine. There was nothing to compete with it when it was first introduced. There was no, no combine that size, that big. It was a very high, uh, high production, high capacity combine. But it had a few weak spots. Uh, the, uh, they needed a, IH, the ag line did not have a six cylinder gas engine available that was big enough to power it. So they had to go to the truck line and borrow a V8 engine from the truck line. So they used the 345 and the 392 engines. 345 was standard, 392 was optional. They also had the 407 diesel engine as option. But uh, you gotta think back at this time, combines were all largely gas. And so the uh, well, gas powered. So, uh, that was the standard engine, and a lot of dealers to keep the price down, they didn't want to up, you know, they didn't switch or order the diesel engine because it cost more, several thousand dollars more, and that was a lot of money back in that time. So they, they usually spec out a combine, pretty much standard, you know, a few options that uh, that you know the farmers would need in your area, uh, but uh, anyway, you, you just stick with the standard engine option. Very few people ordered ordered optional engines. So the the V8 engines, okay, they were they had a lot of power, but the, when they did. The 915, a couple new, was well, the first, they had the first turret uh, loading auger, so that was kind of nice. That was a good feature, and you see that on all our combines today. It was hydraulically actually. Uh, it was also the first, IH's first experiment with an enclosed engine compartment, so that was kind of new. Uh, the other thing is the 915, 950 was hydro, strictly hydro, you, you couldn't order a belt drive, um, and so that was kind of new. But anyway, with the enclosed engine compartment in combination with the V8 engine, used lots of gas, and it liked to drip oil, and then you had the, the engine, closed engine compartment, IH didn't get all the engine compartment sealed enough at the factory, so chaff could get in there, and then you had the, the exhaust manifolds originally on the early combines, they had a hot, uh, from the forward side of the engine, the engine was transversely, so the one bank of uh, exhaust outlets is on the front, the other is on the back, they run the front exhaust underneath the engine, where all this oil was dripping down, and the chaff was collecting, and that made it, uh, nice source for a fire to start. And so a lot of these early combines, they had problems with catching fire. My Uncle Blanche combine did catch fire. I remember them having to pull it back into town and there was, it was towards the end of the, uh, early, getting into early winter and it was cold and they were up there, you know, fixing all the wiring and everything, getting it back into the service so they could go back to the field. And uh, so that kind of gave the 815 and 915 a black eye for a while. Um, they redesigned it in 73 and made a lot of improvements and, and then it really became a really good combine. And, and, but it still tarnished their reputation there a little bit. And, and, the, and the, in the 1969 to 1977, 66, 76, so uh, seven, eight years of production, we only were able to sell four of those combines in that time frame. And uh, so where, when Axial Flows came out, we had we sold three of them in, in the time we had from 77 to, to 80 when we closed down. We were, we'd sold, so in that much shorter time, we sold almost as many that actually closed as we sold in 815, 915. So another thing the company did in the 60s was having customers come back to the plants to, to tour the plants to see how their tractors and combines were being built. So my grandpa took a number of our customers back to Rock Island and to East Moline to go through the, the facilities there, the formal, formal plant and the East Moline plant. And I remember uh, my uncle Len, he went on one of those and he was talking about how those tractors were being built and I was just fascinating to me. And so as soon as I you know, heard about that, I said, boy, I want to go see that. And uh, finally in the early 70s, I think 1971, we were going to Chicago for our first family vacation, my mom and dad and I. And, and my mom were talking about where we we're going to go, and she asked me anything I wanted to see. You know, first thing I thought of, I want to go see Farmall. So, <laughs> so we we did go get to see it. I was like nine years old, and at that time, or ten, barely ten. And my mom had written ahead to the company saying, you know, we're going to be in uh, Rock Island on this day. We'd like a tour of the factory. And and so we got there to my factory. And shortly after we left, the phone rang, and my grandpa answered it. And somebody from Farmall and said, uh, we are got your request here for a tour, and that's fine. We, we got one question, how old is this, uh, your grandson? And he said, well, he said, he's nine or 10. And they said, oh, well, we got a minimum age requirement of 12. And uh, so they were telling him he wouldn't be, I wouldn't be able to go on the tour. My grandpa told him, if you don't let that yellow boy go through that factory, you're gonna have one disappointed little boy on your hands. <laughs> so when we got there, mom and dad and I, and I went into the office and I, you know, said, hey, we're here for the tour. They told him, well, we're gonna make, we shouldn't do this, but we're going to make an exception. We have a minimum of 12, but we're going to let your son go through the farm all works. And that was fascinating for me to, to see how we went down the, in the 
uh, under their tracks and into the area where they were banking gears and they were doing induction hardening and machining all the teeth. It was just fascinating to see all that. And then we went on the production line and you could see, you know, starting building up the transmission, putting all the bearings and dry shafts and gears in there and, and just walking down the line, you know, as you could see the tractor start to come to shape and, and then it got painted and, and uh, so it was just you know, a fascinating thing for me to see as a kid. Really, really had never forgotten that. Um, so that, that closed out the 60s and then we go into the super 70s and you know, the super 70s were a really great time being an IH dealer. Uh, we did some remodeling in our area, uh, parts department. Uh, my dad, you know, every, always ordering parts uh, to have in inventory to every, you know, order two, you know, stock one and get the customer back in the field. So we, the tractors were getting too big, we couldn't put them on the showroom anymore. So uh, we took over the showroom area and expanded our parts department area. Uh, Finally, in 1978, we did give up the truck contract. Uh, the, uh, I don't know, we, for some reason, trucks kind of quit selling in our area. Um, and uh, so, 78, we gave that up. I think part of it hurt when they quit making pickups. We used to always be able to sell a couple pickups every year. And, uh, but uh, so, in 75, they quit that. Uh, but I got old enough. I, I started being active in the business. I do housekeeping, cleaning, sweeping the floors. and. I got uh, Cup Cadets, I love Cup Cadets, and it helps set those up, and, and I learned how to you know, work on those engine, the Kohler engines and everything, and Cadet 60, and uh, I did mowing around the lots, keeping the grass mowed, so around where the equipment was on display, and learning how to do repairs, and learning various aspects of the business, and, and uh, also started, as I got a little older, I started going on sales calls with Grandpa. Grandpa, when I got, especially when I got old enough to drive, Grandpa, I'd get home from school, and he says, hey, we gotta go visit this customer, and, I'd hop in the truck and I'd drive and he'd ride along and we'd go you know, talk to the customer about selling the tractor. And, and then also, and, uh, I got my second scout then, a real scout, uh, in 79, so that was really fun yeah, since he was old enough to drive. So things going on, I think, company then at the time, the Kansas City region, uh, they started closing the district offices. So the district office in Omaha was closed and also Denver, and they formed a regional offices. So across the nation, they had 12 regional offices that uh, were open then, and closing all these district offices helped reduce cost. Uh, Kansas City regional offices in Weir, Nebraska was part of that, and so we had Kansas, Missouri, Nebraska, Colorado, Wyoming. So uh, there was only, a, after they moved it all to Kansas City, I think there was only one time we went down to pick up equipment down there. Uh, we were in Omaha before, we'd go up there frequently a couple times a year, and I, that was some of my favorite memories of my dad when we were going to, uh, uh, pick up equipment in Omaha. I always enjoyed it. On the pr pr product side, uh, it was a very productive time for the the uh, company as well. The Series 86, 66 and 86 tractors were introduced. The 400 cycle air planner was also introduced. We sold over 40 of those planners. I, I thought that's pretty significant in our small, for a small town dealer. We, I thought that was really good. Axial flow combine was introduced in 77. And then the 2 plus 2 tractor was introduced in 79. And uh, so I got to go with my grandpa on some of these introductions, the 86 series tractor and stuff. So that was a lot of great memories for me. Uh, Kansas City office, Max McAllister was the regional manager down there then. And they brought in some VIPs from Chicago, Pat Kane, who later went on to take over the truck, uh, was the vice president of truck. And Stan Lancaster, he was the vice president in the ag, ag department. And so they brought in some big VIPs. Um, 66 series was introduced there at the beginning of the 1970s and uh, it was a good series tractors. The biggest thing was the, the, the uh, change was uh, the uh, 400, 300 and 400 series engines were introduced and a lot of dealers were nervous about that because the 361 and 407, they were some great engines. They were probably the best engines International ever designed, built. Uh, they were bal well balanced, well designed, very durable uh, and they were concerned about the uh, these new engines and how they would hold up, but they did hold up well. They had a wet sleeve design. The, part of the reason the 361 and 407, they had a dry sleeve design. You couldn't get as much power out of them because you couldn't run them as fast because they did generate too much heat. You couldn't get the wet heat away from the sleeve as fast. So the wet series, wet sleeve design helped to improve the efficiency of the engine and get more horsepower. New factory cab option, that was another nice plus uh, with the 66 series. Then they added over time a couple more models, the, the V8 models, the 1468 and 1568 were added in 1566. It was kind of interesting when the 1566 was introduced, we used to sell a lot of 1466, but then everybody wanted to go up to the 1566. So we didn't sell many 1466s after that. Um, series 86 tractor introduction, I got to go with my grandfather to Chicago for that. It was a really memorable time. 
They did that at the McCormick Place Convention Center. Uh, it was uh, we, they, it was they rolled out. The, I rolled out the red carpet for the dealers on that deal, and uh, they took us into the big theater there in the McCormick Convention Center, and uh, had uh, actors there. They had skits and all kinds of things. And various company men come up there and talked about the tractor, and, and uh, the big th improvement on that was the, the the new control center, the cab. And I remember one of the dealers saying, "Gentlemen, we finally have a tractor with a cab now." So. Uh, that uh, it was a very nice cab, and uh, we also got to see a couple other the HT340, the, the turbine tractor. You know that was I didn't realize that was actually built back in the 60s. They had it on display there. That was really neat to see, and that was a really cool looking tractor. And uh, on the motor truck side, you know, unfortunately they got decided to pull the plug on the pickups and travel laws there in '75, and they introduced the Terror and Traveler uh, to try to fill part of that void there, where they were abandoning that share of the market to at least try to. Keep their foot in the door on that. 77, the axle flow combines were introduced, and so we got uh, uh, went out to Kansas City for that. Each regional office inter did an introduction for their respective dealers, so each each regional office did some different things. That we went to Kansas City for that, and, and uh, I remember them talk, starting the meeting, and they said they reviewed the market share. Where were we at? IH was at on combines. We were fourth, so uh, it wasn't wasn't a very good story. There, Deer and Massey Ferguson and Gleaner, they were ahead of us. And then he said, gentlemen, that's about to change. And they opened the curtain, and here came out this brand new combine and sleek lines. And uh, uh, we said, wow, this is going to be something. And once we got to learn about the new the rotary concept, and, and they said, and there are no straw walkers. We all stood up and gave a standing ovation. Uh, the Steelers uh, got rid of the straw walkers. So anyway, it was designed. It was easy to service and maintain. And it was really, a, IH really finally had a combine then. And so they had three models that were introduced there, 40, 80, 60, and 80. And uh, we ordered two, we ordered a 40 and an 80. We had those both sold before. My grandpa debated about whether she'd order a 1460, and he wished he would have after we, we decided not to, because it was a lot of money to, you know, two combines, a little big, you know, we always tried to pay as we go. And uh, anyway, they, uh, we didn't get a 1460, we could have had it sold as well. Then in 79, we got to go to Phoenix with my grandpa for the two plus two introduction, and uh, the revolutionary new tractor design, four wheel drive, row crop tractor. So nobody had anything like that had a new hydraulic system, the pressure flow compensating hydraulics, and uh, the four-wheel design uh, uh, less, had better traction, less com soil compaction, so that was really interesting. And that in February in Phoenix, when they did this, and each afternoon it tended to want to cloud up and rain there in Phoenix, and so uh, they, we, they took us all out the field there in these buses, and, and uh, probably what sold the lot design, the concept is a two plus two more than anything, was when it rained, the buses would get stuck, they had to bring the two plus twos and pull all these buses. So all us dealers on these buses, we watched these two plus twos pull the buses out of the, the uh, field, and that, that really convinced the, the, the concept of the, the four-wheel drive design. And uh, so, uh, so as we end the '70s and into the '80s, uh, there was a couple things happened. The company side, there were some new products still being introduced. The early riser planters were introduced 1980. Did the introduction in Kansas City for that. 1420 was also introduced, Axi Flow, uh, and then the Series 50 tractors were introduced. And uh, but then you had some, uh, on the company side, on the other side of the coin, you had several shocks, that, uh, what I call exogenous shocks, that the farm crisis started due to the Russian grain embargo. Prices plummeted, farmers stopped buying, didn't have money. Uh, the UAW strike also uh, incurred huge losses for the company. And uh, also at that time, inflation was very high back in the 70s. And so the feds were trying to throttle that back by raising interest rates, and the harvester was buying lots of money, and, and so that uh, the interest rate on it killed the market demand for people being able to buy finance things to buy uh, farmers, and, but then uh, the company is also having to pay very high interest to finance the debt. So anyway, last uh, I'd like to recognize some of the employees. Uh, every company or business is successful only as good as their employees. And we were very blessed over the years to have a number of very good employees to help our company, or help our business thrive. And, and uh, we don't have time to read off the names here, but we do want to recognize them. And also, there are some very company men that I also like to recognize. Uh, the zone men, those were your, that was the first line of the uh, face of the company. You work with them. You always had to be good to them. And uh, so. Uh, there's also uh, Roy Carpenter was another one, and uh, Cal, Cal Rampage that worked in Kansas City, Omaha. So, my grandpa died in 1980, October, and that ended our contract with IH, and so we began a two-year process of shutting down. 
and uh, we did our parts inventory and return. We weren't on the computer system back in those days. We had three over three semi loads of tractors or tractor trailers of parts to send back, and we had two auctions then to sell the used equipment uh, for the building fixtures and stuff. So, anyway, thank you for your attention and uh, appreciate the opportunity to share our story. And uh, we'll be around out here afterwards if you want to like this. Ron, we thank you. Thank you, Ron. Round of applause. We very much appreciate all Ron does to support the Harvester Heritage. He's very much involved in many, many, many ways with the Harvester Heritage. He and Yvonne, his wife, and uh, we want to apologize, uh, obviously because of COVID-19, we could not meet in the auditorium, and we know the visual, and it's, it's really a shame when someone goes to work putting together uh, the material that Ron has put together. You can barely see it, but uh, see us again in, in, in uh, Illinois next year and on down the road. And I'm sure we'll have many more interesting presentations. Thank you for being here.